I grew up in Ohio in the 70s, and me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time. Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest, and my parents would drop me off in the morning, and we'd stay in the woods all weekend. We'd only come out for school. Hell, we loved pretending we were frontiersmen, as we'd build shelters, traps, and practice making fire with sticks the whole nine yards. When we got to be in high school, we got this notion to pull a Stand By Me. This was based on the movie of the same name that had just come out. The idea was that we'd walk the railroad tracks out in the country, but instead of looking for a dead body, we'd find cool bridges to fish from and camp a little ways off the tracks. Of course we knew this was dangerous and we'd likely be trespassing, but we were kids. We had a lot of fun. We did find beautiful rivers. We discovered bridges no one went to. We fished, we hid from trains. At night we camped in the woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. It was idyllic. In fact, it was so fun we did it multiple times and never had a problem. After high school, me and Joe went our own ways. We both left home, but always stayed in touch and always tried to coordinate visits so we'd see each other occasionally. Well, one summer in the mid-90s, it worked out that we were both in town for about a week. We'd do stuff with the family in the day, and at night, we'd either catch drinks at the bar or sit around Joe's house around a fire and talk about the old days. One night, me and Joe got to talking about our stand-by-me trips. Well, nostalgia and beer are a hell of a mix. Soon, we decided to take a day, walk the rails, camp one night, and walk home. That day came, and we started out early morning. We had my wife drop us off in our old spot, where we used to start, right outside our hometown. She thought this was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it. When she pulled away, Joe suggested that instead of walking the usual route, we'd take the opposite direction just to be adventurous. We knew the land well and we had a map, so I gave a what the hell and off we set. The day went fine. It was fun and a little sad but in a good way. We found a bridge and sat on the edge, smoked a joint, and moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and other stuff. And before night started to set in, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick, forested area, trees on every side of the train tracks so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We had brought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up, we decided to do a little scouting of the perimeter. Now, this is what we used to do in the old days too. We'd walk the area around a little bit to make sure some dude's house wasn't just over a hill and we were actually camping in their yard. We'd walk maybe a hundred or so feet into the woods and up a small incline. We figured if we didn't see anything from on top of this short hill, we'd be fine. But when we got to the top, we saw an old building down at the bottom, about a hundred yards into the woods. It was barely visible. We pondered over what to do. We both assumed it was a sugar shack or something, because there didn't appear to be a clear road into it. From where we were, there didn't look to be anyone in it either. All was quiet and there was no movement that could be seen, and no lights. We decided to walk a little closer, just to make sure. We came down the hill very slowly, and as we neared the building, we saw it wasn't a sugar shack at all. It was actually an old church. 
It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a squat, a sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from the years of moss and rot. The cross still stood up on top of the place, also weathered black. None of the windows had glass, and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside. There were rows of pews and a built-up section in the front for a preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in. We sure as hell didn't want to. Beyond all that, there was no sign of anyone else. No footprints, no paths, no roads. It was an abandoned church. We left immediately and went back up the hill to our spot we had picked to camp. Having a hill between us and the church definitely made us feel better, but we were still a little uneasy. We chalked it up to the natural creepiness seeing a church in the middle of the woods would elicit. Besides, at this point it was dusk and we decided to rig up our hammocks and go to sleep and to move on at early morning. Night set in and we lay in our hammocks and shot the shit. And we begin to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little like this. Do you hear that? Yeah, what the fuck is that? Sounds like people singing. And it did sound just like singing. We both slid right out of our hammocks and hunkered down straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two and the singing continued, but it wasn't getting louder. We decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move very quietly in the woods from the old days. It was second nature to us. The moon was barely out, but it provided enough light so you wouldn't walk right into a tree but it was nearly pitch black. We didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill and we didn't talk. When we got to the top, we saw light in the distance. It was coming from the church and the singing was coming from the inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a hushed conversation that boiled down to can you believe this shit? The light looked to be candlelight from the way it flickered. And though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but in another language. We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was in there. But we only saw occasional shadows. We had no intention of getting closer either. We had about a football filled length of distance between us and we aimed to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit and then it stopped. After that, a booming male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice thoroughly scared the shit out of me. It sounded like some Old Testament preacher you see in movies, but again, it was like he was speaking in a different language because we couldn't understand a single word. Eventually it got to where the single male voice would say something, and then a bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while, and then they all broke into this long sustained wail that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so disturbing that I covered my ears, and then it stopped. At this point, I was getting ready to say, let's get the fuck out of here, when Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed, they're coming out. We were far enough away that we couldn't make them out really well, but what we could see was a line of figures walk out the open doorway, all holding hands in single file. We could see that some of them had flashlights. They began to sing again the light from the flashlights began to move toward us in the hill. We booked it back down to our campsite, 
grabbed our shit and ran to the tracks. Once there, we ran down the tracks in the direction we had come from. After a few minutes, we stopped and looked back. We saw the lights coming down the hill. They were moving erratically, like whoever was holding them was shaking them. We continued to run in spurts and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came to a road. By our map, we knew a small town was about 15 minutes down the road. We walked there, got to a 24-hour gas station, and called my wife to come get us. My wife and other friends all just thought it was kids messing with us. But I heard those voices, and they sure as hell didn't sound like kids to me. Not sure who those people were, but it was definitely the creepiest thing that happened to me out in the woods. That story was crazy. What do you think the two guys experienced out there? Do you think those were kids playing around in an abandoned church in the middle of the night? Hmm, I don't know about that. Could this have been a secret cult having a gathering? I wonder what would have happened if they got spotted by this mysterious group. Or do you all think they were spotted and that's why they came out of the church? It's a good thing they didn't get caught because who knows what could have happened. There are a lot of strange things happening in Ohio with the land being built on top of the graves of the many late Native Americans and Civil War sites. And the usual sites of abandoned houses and buildings that lay across the land it's no wonder so many horror stories come out of the Buckeye State. Hey Mike, how you doing man? Um, love the podcast, listening to you guys for a while now. So, um, let's get to the story. I have something attached to me that got attached to me when I was younger. Story for another day. But this happened around this time last year in the Great Smoky Mountains. Um, my godfather had purchased a piece of property with a trailer on there for really, really cheap. And he sent me and a friend of mine to go hunting in it. So uh, I, I know he brought a 280. I brought a uh, AR-15 308 bill. And we're out there. We get to the trailer. It's, it's about three and a half, four and a half hours from where I used to live, which is uh, Winston-Salem area. And we're out in the Great Smoky. So we're there. We get there. We get there around midnight. And we're unpacking the truck and everything. And right off the bat, I have this really, really bad feeling. Not a bad feeling, just like a presence was with us, or like there was eyes on us. And start to finish, that feeling never left. So, you know, we, we got to the hunting stands and everything. And as soon as, you know, 3 a.m. hit, I noticed I kept hearing rustling coming around, more so around about 20 or 30 yards away from me. The whole night, just rustling, rustling, rustling. And me and my boy smoked a little bit of herb. And I was like, you know, maybe I'm just changing stuff and being paranoid, yada, yada, yada. And we didn't bring our phones with us. So he's about 600 yards away in a different stand. So the whole night goes on. And at some point, the rustling gets heavier. Like it's footsteps walking around. I'm from the woods. So I'm, I'm used, you know, I, I can tell you what, when it sounds like a person or not. That's compared to an animal. So I'm zeroing in. I'm there. I'm getting a really bad vibe. And I see a pair of eyes looking at me. So I did the only I could think of. I zeroed in and took a shot point blank at the guy, basically. And the eyes didn't even blink. And I started to get freaked out. And about five minutes later, the eyes came back. But now there were more than one pair of eyes. So we're 
I'm freaking out. I'm going through this. I let off three rounds. My buddy lets off one round. And we, you know, we meet in our meeting spot in the middle. The trailer itself is about half a mile, a little bit more than half a mile away from us in deep woods. So me and him are hauling ass out of there. And the whole time, it just feels like there's something on our ass. Just something following us, not wanting us to go, not wanting us to be there. After half hour, 45 minutes of trekking through the woods, we get to the trailer and it just stops. Everything just stops, get inside. And the whole night, every time we go outside, we can hear this type of pacing, just the pacing going back and forth, back and forth. Um, I'm gonna try to find my old phone where I snapped a picture of, of the wood area and you can see two eyes, just two red, red eyes staring at us. And he, he brought his, we brought a dog with us, um, Nami. Amazing, well-behaved pit bull. I have never seen this girl bark. And as soon as we let her out the trailer, she went and she was snarling and growling and barking. And the only thing we could think of, you know, we were about 18. I'm, I'm 24 now. We were about 18. Is we dumped most of our clips into the woods where we heard the noise from. Just dumped it. And it got quiet. Real quiet. Eerie quiet. And just like without a beat. Boom. Pacing again and again and again. And when we went inside, it was just a combination of hearing noises throughout the night. Hearing we're almost sounding like wailing and we hauled out as soon as we saw daybreak we hauled out we made it home and he unfortunately had scratches up and down his back and I told him what happened to me and he said that throughout the night he had the same experience except he kept hearing you know voices almost voice like noises coming from around the area and he started to freak out um his story was very similar to mine and we told my uncle everything and he just seemed weirded out by it i know he went out there and had a hunting trip not too long afterwards then when he came back really early and we asked him what happened and he just blew it off completely didn't want to talk about it hadn't didn't want to do nothing but the property itself and that was the last we went out there. Um, honest, be honest with you, that was my last hunting trip. Was that day? I have not been out in the woods since. I don't know what it is. I, mean, I go hiking, but I have not gone hunting overnight or through the night in a very, very long time because of that. But uh, I've had weird stuff like that happen to me for for a, for a couple of years now. Um, let me know if you want me to tell you the uh, the origin story where. Uh, we ran into a old satanic ritual shed and proceeded to piss and destroy it. That 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 always in us on a great story. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity, man. Love your show. Love the podcast. Keep it up, my guy. Have a good one. Thanks for calling in. The Great Smoky Mountains has a lot of history. History in the form of stories passed down from Irish and Scottish immigrants who once settled in the Smoky Mountains. One of those stories is about a creepy urban legend known as the Spearfinger, which I mentioned in the last episode. As she is known to haunt the chill Howie Mountain Range, the land of the indigenous, which is also part of the Great Smoky Mountains, it seems like her range of haunting extends outside a bit farther than we initially thought. The Spearfinger is essentially a shapeshifter that is known to mislead and trick individuals by pretending to be a familiar face so that she can draw them in and snatch their livers for dinner. It is reported that she would make sudden noises, although hikers who have reported the noise claim to not know where the source of the noise came from. Hikers have also reported the feeling of being watched while in the forest. This haunting has been enough to drive many hikers out of the woods. Along with the Spearfinger, the area has a lot more sinister hauntings 
that could have contributed to the scare the caller experienced. What do you think happened here? Now before I go on to the next story, if you all would like to call in with your own story, I would love to hear it and feature it on my next episode. You can call the Scarecast hotline at 213-320-0390. Again, that's 213-320-0390. Every call will have a 5 minute limit, but should you have to continue, you can just call right back and pick up where you left off. Also feel free to text this number if you want to give me any feedback or compliments on the podcast. Me and some of my buddies used to go to this place called Profile Rock in Freetown, Massachusetts, late at night, sometimes 2 to 3 in the morning. One night during the summer, I'd go to Profile Rock with three of my friends at 2.30 a.m. just to mess around and explore. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but Profile Rock and the area we were in is part of an area called the Bridgewater Triangle which is a site of alleged paranormal activities and is also one of the most haunted areas in the state I live in. Continuing on, we climbed Profile Rock itself and stayed on top of it for maybe uh, three to four hours. We all decided to leave. Now as you're leaving Profile Rock, you have to go down this long path that's about two miles long to get back to where we parked our car. Two of my friends are walking about 20 to 30 feet in front of me and my other friend. Now, I'll never know why I turned around. I didn't have a feeling like someone was watching us. I just simply turned around because besides the moonlight shining through the trees, in certain areas we only had our flashlights on our cell phones to make our way around. I remember turning around and seeing someone running at us from about a hundred feet away, full speed. What threw me off wasn't that they were running at us, it was how they were running. You know how a zombie walks in a horror movie, dragging one of its legs almost limping? That's how this someone was running at us. At first I didn't say anything and possibly assumed it was one of my friends or someone that was already in the area who got injured and needed assistance. Until this someone made it to an area of the path where the moonlight reached the trees and gave them some perspective. What I saw still chokes me up to this day. You ever see a child try to draw a person? How they make a stick figure most of the time? That's exactly how this someone looked. I caught maybe a 10 second glance as it was running under the moonlight lit trees, but I saw no distinguishable facial features, no eyes, no mouth, and no ears. Its arms and legs looked like that of an extremely malnourished person, only completely black, and it didn't look like skin or any type of clothing from what I could see. I almost can't even describe it, to be honest, and you could blatantly tell it wasn't a mask or any of those Halloween blacked out suits. I recall calling out to my friend in a panicked voice who was walking with me, who was now maybe 10 feet ahead of myself. I shined my cell phone light on him as he was looking where I was just looking, and I could tell right away from his facial expression that I wasn't seeing things. It was now maybe 40 feet away from us if that was almost the same distance as our friends were in front of us. And me and my friend just took flight and started running. My two other friends in front of us asked, what's wrong? And I replied, just run. And all four of us jetted for our car. I remember taking a glance back as we were running and there was nothing there, even though whatever was chasing us would certainly be on our tails by now. We all hopped in the car 
and my friend who was walking with me yells, Dude, tell me you seen that! What the fuck was that? I told him I seen the same thing. I asked him to describe to all of us what he saw, and he described literally the exact same thing I witnessed. By now, my other two friends are thinking we were joking around or messing with them, until my friend who was walking with me swore on his father who just passed away not even a month ago that he's telling the truth. I was kind of frustrated to be honest because I couldn't believe my other two friends didn't see it as they turned around to question why we were running in the first place. But it doesn't matter now. We actually went back there with a few more people the next day and witnessed nothing, of course. I'll never know what it was or who it was or what it wanted, but I know one thing. There's no way in hell two people both imagined seeing some stick figure spectra in the woods. What in the world do you all think that was? A little background about the Bridgewater Triangle, which its name is sort of inspired by the Bermudas Triangle. The place is known to host a large set of weird sightings including zombies, gatherings of satanic cults, ghosts, UFOs, and even Bigfoot. It's the Pandora's box, according to one folklorist. Several notable places in the Bridgewater Triangle include the infamous Hackamock Swamp, which people have experienced weird and unexplained balls of light floating around the swamp. There's even a story of a red-headed hitchhiker who roams Route 44, who rocks a plaid flannel shirt and jeans, who is known to get into people's cars and then mysteriously disappear into thin air. There are all sorts of books and websites dedicated to this place, and it could be a great place to visit if you are a skeptic and want to explore the unknown. Going back to the story... It's terrifying to even know that during the three to four hours they were out there, they were not alone. I wonder what would have happened had the boys not ran and let the figure get closer. But to be honest, I'm really glad they didn't because who knows what this entity's intentions could have been. Or if it would have ended up physically hurting them if it did get that close. According to several posters, there have been many stories about these weird stick figure entities in which one Redditor connected it to an Indian legend explaining how these figures are often seen in the Blackfeet Indian Reservation in Montana, even recounting about a story involving his cousin who was sleeping in a trailer one night with his friend who was sleeping in a nearby bunk. His cousin will wake up in the dead of the night to see his friend being dragged off his bunk by his legs by a stick man. His friend woke up. They both freaked the hell out and ran out of the trailer. Not sure how true that story is, but I definitely cringe just imagining this stick figure popping up in the middle of the night and that would surely keep me from sleeping if I was to ever camp out in the woods.